So about a year ago, I made a video talking about the British Army uniforms used during the American Revolution and the various ways in which they evolve uh, depending on the rank of the wearer. And it proved to be a pretty popular video. In fact, as of the time of this recording, it is the second most popular video on my channel. So I figured it was about time I made a follow-up video. But this video is not going to be about the British uniforms of the American Revolution, for once. It is instead going to be about the French uniforms. And I could stand here talking about it for hours, but I think you would much rather hear from somebody who knows a heck of a lot more about them than I do. So, without further ado, may I present to you Mr. Ian Graves of the Bourbonnet Regiment. Hello. Hello, all. Uh, I have here uh, assembled a lot of French uniform items. Uh, the French army, uh, from about the time of the 1760s all up in time to the French Revolution, uh, was evolving quite quickly and uh, had a lot of changes and tried to... It's called the Prussianing in Europe. They tried to Prussian their forces and, and cut them down a lot more, make them much more refined. So we're dealing with the 1779 clothing warrant here in the Bourbonnet. Uh, the bit of the history of the Bourbonnet, uh, we landed in Newport, Rhode Island in 1780 with about 1,400 men split between two battalions. The French battalion has uh, five companies each. Battalion one has four Fusilier companies, one Grenadier company. Second battalion has four Fusilier companies, one Chasseur company. Chasseurs being light infantry. Uh, grenadiers and chasseurs, their uniforms about the same as the enlisted, uh, but they have different color epaulets. Uh, a grenadier is the red one, the chasseur is the green one. Uh, they are in the French unit. They are sewn in around the neck. So you got the neckline there and the button is there. The white is a regular fusilier company. On the tails of a French army coat, uh, you would have fleur-de-lis on the fusiliers. The grenadiers would have grenades, and the chasseurs would have bugles. They would be facing color. They would not be gr green or red, however. Uh, the Bourbonnet, we are a silver button regiment, which means that our pocket flaps are vertical, and they're much larger than the normal horizontal pocket flaps. So in the French army, there are six regiments per color group. So there are six regiments that have the same color of distinction three of which are brass buttons, three of which are silver buttons. Uh, the gray buttons, silver button regiments, uh, there would be one that would have a white lapel with black trim and a black uh, cuff with white trim. There'd be one that would have black and black with white trim, and there'd be one that would have a black lapel with white trim. And the gold buttons would be the same. They'd just be going different direction pocket flap, and that would be the difference there. The French army, also had uh, a semi-off-duty coat. It was called a vest, V-E-S-T-E. -E. Uh, it was just worn underneath the habi most of the time. So you'd go as gilet, waistcoat, vest, sleeved waistcoat jacket, and then you would call the habi on top. The habi was meant for actual stuff, actual use. So uh, battles, uh, sentry duty, uh, official formations, parades, etc. Other than that, they would try to keep you in the vest because they want to keep the habi nice and clean. The uh, French army also had different colors of gaiters. We had white gaiters, again, for formal occasions like battles, parades, formations. Uh, the black gaiters, which would there'd be two pairs, there'd be the old white gaiters you would paint black, and then there'd be black wool gaiters. And those were meant more for daily use fatiguing, again, keeping your whites as white as possible. Uh, for hats, we had a regular chapeau, uh, nothing too fancy about it. This is an officer one, so the tape is done in black silk, and I have a, a silk cockade, and I have a silver piece of lace going around the button. The enlisted hat would be the same, but instead of silver, they would have a black, and they would have black wool trim around. We do have goose feathers in our hat. That's a holdover from a previous warrant that was supposed to be written out in the 1779, but a lot of soldiers decided they didn't like that, so they didn't do it. The enlisted cockade, though, instead of being silver, would be made out of linen. You see the three colors in the cockade. There's white for France, black for America, and red for the Spanish alliance. Because we were allied with all, th we were allied with the two, and that's what was put into our cockade. In terms of equipage, as an officier, I have my sword and my bayonet. They're on the same belt here. And I have a cartridge box, my cartouche. It's the same as the enlisted, but it's slightly smaller. That's our regimental. Uh, uh, plate. The infantry cartridge box is quite a bit larger. Um, it just is. It just is. 
The plate is larger, and on the new warrant, the 1779, the bayonet is attached to the cartridge box sling, and it, it gets slung around here on the front. That way it's just one belt, less leather, less to handle about. There were still some French companies that never got the new warrant, and so they would still have a waist belt with a bayonet attached to it from here. Sergeants and corporals, they had swords that they would have as their rank, and that would go over the other side, it would go on top, and then they would carry both. So for rank insignia in the French army, we would have different lines that would go on the coats. A corporal would get two blue, and then a sergeant would get a silver. The corporal's lines would go, they'd be sewn there around like that, and they'd go parallel to the cuff. This is the last one where they do that. Right after this, they go and they become angled at the cuff. And then a sergeant would get sewn right in there. Every company has a sergeant major, but uh, it's not a sergeant major as in the British Army. It basically just has the ranks of a first sergeant. And a sergeant major would get two silver lines. One would go here, and the other would go in between the first two buttons of the cuff. We also have a quartermaster sergeant uh, rank, and they would get two silver lines that would be right about here, and they would go slanted. And that's where the rest of the slanted lines come from. The quartermaster sergeant in the French is Fure Escrovon. Uh, there's a photo of it, which I have sent over to Chris. I'm sure it's probably right here somewhere. Uh, it's very cool because he's a sergeant. He's playing the cards, and he has his he has a sergeant's line there, and he has his two here. And you also see kind of a V, uh, blue lines on his upper here. And that is for how many years of service he has. So this was instituted um, about a decade ago. I think it was in 1770 by Louis XV. And so for every eight years you were enlisted, you would get a blue triangle or a blue uh, chev you would sew on. So you'd get one blue chev, and at 16 years you get another blue chev, but at 24 years you would get a, a, a two sword medal, which has uh, two golden swords uh, with a gold round and it'd be on a red background. And that was sewn right onto your chest. And there's another portrait of a man named Jean Thurel, again, probably right around here, and he has three of those. He joined the army under Louis XIV and served until 1806. And if you're doing the math, that's a number of years. Uh, when he, at the time of the portrait being taken, he was given three medals uh, 20, of the two swords, which is 72 years of service, I believe. I did that right. Uh, he was given the last medal a few days early. Uh, he was taken before King Louis XVI. And he, uh, Louis XVI offered to induct him into the Order of St. Louis or to give him his extra badge two months early. And Jean Thoreau politely said, Sir, I will take my medal. The uh, Order of St. Louis was meant for nobility, so the king offering it to a commoner was, very, was a very high rank of distinction. The other medal you see on his jacket was painted in later by Napoleon. He liked to go back and paint over stuff, but that has nothing to do with the uh, Royalist French army. So, uh, unlike the British Army, where if you have an epaulette, you're an officer. In the French Army, you have an epaulette, you're an officer, and it's different. So this is a lower order lieutenant. We have a contra epaulette, and we have an epaulette. Um, they have fringe, one doesn't, one does. Just does. Um, then higher ranks get different styles. So this would be a, a slightly higher lieutenant. You see it's the same basic design, but it's silver on red. Uh, you also see ones, uh, once you get all of that under once you take all of the, uh, the triangles off, then that's just a pure captain. Uh, brass button regiments, they would be gold epaulets, and they would match the color of the uniform. I'm also not wearing my uskol, which is the French for a gorget. Um, here it is. Unlike the British Army, it's not a necklace. It actually just attaches to the buttons here, and it goes underneath the epaulets. Uh, French officers, when they are off duty, are not supposed to wear their uskol or their epaulets, uh, but they Never wore these, but they always kept the epaulets on, probably because they thought they looked nice. But we're supposed to take them off when we are off duty, which is why we have these big silver bars here, and that's to look fancy without our epaulets on. Uh, so what I've gone over so far is just white-coated French units, which are the more French units. Because back then, nation states aren't really a thing as we think of them yet. So there are a lot of, there are a lot, there are a lot of regiments that are in foreign or foreigners in service to the king. Uh, the Irish regiments, for instance, Dillons and Frasers, they were over here in the American Revolution. Uh, you also have like uh, Luzon's Legion, uh, Luzon's Legion en tangé, Luzon's Legion of Foreigners. Uh, you have uh, Royal Dupont. Now they are from Alsace-Lorraine, so they're not technically French 
ethnicity quite yet, but they're not Germans either, and the Duke Luzon was very loyal to the king. Um, so these regiments do not have white coats, and as such, they have different rules. Uh, Dillon's and Frazier's both had red coats. Uh, Dillon's was yellow, and Frazier's was a shade of blue. Uh, then you had uh, Luzon's and uh, Dupont. They were, both di they were both different shades of blue on their coats. There are still the same rules. Corporals, corporals get two lines, sergeants get one line. Uh, sergeants are still silver, so it's silver throughout the army. Corporals get two lines, but they are now white wool. Um, and that's really it. Officers had the same general rules, same style of epaulets, same or skull, just same rules, take it off when you're not on duty. Uh, in terms of the shades, because in the, in the British Army, the shade of your coat also mattered. Uh, we don't really have that in the French Army. It's just white. Uh, French officers, they still had to buy their own kit, so you tend to see them having a larger amount of coats, and the coats tended to vary a little. They were highly encouraged to keep their coats on warrant. You do see frock coats being used, but not on duty. But they are, it's, it's just said they can have a better fabric and a different manufacturer. But everything is supposed to stay the same. So really the only way to tell the rank is the epaulets and a skull. It does make it easier on a reenactor when you get promoted from uh, a private to a sergeant because so you don't have to buy a new coat anymore or at all. You just have to put on a silver stripe. In terms of who's more complicated, uh, the, the French are definitely weird, and the British are definitely weird. Every, there are things that both armies do that are, are a bit anathema to each other's army. Uh, the, Fr the whole point of the French army in the latter half of the 1700s is to really cut down and worry more about the fighting and the tactics and the drill and less about the, the frills of the uniform. So we still do have a lot of frills. There are a lot of differences in between the units. Um, but on the whole, there's no regimental lace that's gotten rid of. Buttons all have the same design, just with a different number inside of them. And there also were never enough buttons made, which is why you see the Bourbon A, we were numbered 13, but you see a lot of number, uh, numbered eight buttons laying around in America. Those come from the Bourbon A, because never enough 13 buttons were made. And when the army was reorganized in 1776, numbers changed. So the French army is working on a budget. So it's much more straightforward but we still do have our ways of showing distinction and um, frills. We have buttonholes that are nicer. Uh, we have the, the binding here, which is unique to the French army. But on the whole, we're, we're no more, more or less intricate than the British, which is different. So sum this up, I'm Ian Graves. I'm the field commander of La Regiment Bourbon A. We are based in Rhode Island, but we have membership all throughout New England. We try to attend events all, as far down the coast as we can. And our whole goal is to show Americans that there is a large history that is intertwined with the French and that without the French involvement, whether it be military presence or military weapons or supplies or money, there really wouldn't be an America as we think about it today. That even though the countries don't get along too well right after the war, it, the, the French support was pivotal to an American success. Hey everyone, it's me again. I just wanted to very quickly give a shout out once again to Ian for having me put together that video. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Ian, in addition to being the commander of the Bourbonnais, he also has his own tailoring business. In fact, he made the 18th century shirt, which I am wearing right now. It's really, really cool. It's a very authentic feeling and looking 18th century linen shirt. It's all hand sewn and it has thread buttons, which is a really cool feature that none of my other shirts have. So if you're a reenactor in need of new gear, I highly recommend checking him out. He can be found on Facebook and Instagram under the name Royal Blue Traders, and I will have a link in the description down below. But uh, anyway, that's going to be it for me today, guys. Hope you all enjoyed, as usual, and as always, God save the king, or perhaps I should say, vive le roi.